Hello everybody. Uh, this video is mainly uh, dedicated for um, last year medical students, interns, uh, house officers and uh, maybe it will also be useful for residents uh, who want to uh, understand brain tumor and that also mainly of high grade uh, glioma. I am Basant Pan from Anapuna Neurological Institute. So if you look at the incidence of tumor, then uh, in the breast cancer, lung cancer, last bowel, prostate, these are the uh, highest killer of uh, uh, tumor. But uh, if you look at the brain and CNS uh, tumor, it occupies about 2% of the whole uh, tumor that uh, the human being can suffer from. And uh, if you look at the incidence, it's about 23 per 100,000 and the prevalence is about 48 per 100,000. And one third of that is high grade, two third of that is low grade. So low grade is uh, more commoner than high grade tumor. And uh, if you look at this uh, age distribution, then you can see that there is a small peak here in the, the younger age group but as they progress, it decreases and then again it rises somewhere around, the peak is somewhere around 60s or you know, 50s, 60s. So you know, most of the tumor in the world that occurs somewhere around 50 to 60s even. So that is also a period where you can have any kind of tumors and that is also uh, so with um, brain tumors. And slightly male is more affected with glioma than females so i just want to show you this picture where this gentleman was you know have had a very very big brain tumor which invaded his skull it which eroded his skin and he was actually using this as a pillow you know and he was sleeping on the tumor itself till uh, it started eroding and smelling and his wife left him then only he came to us for treatment. So if people can die of tumor, they can also live with it. And um, so, you know, you, just to give you an example, how extensive but benign a tumor can be. This is obviously a benign tumor. And then we did a very, very extensive removal of this tumor. And then our main goal was to remove the tumor, but also to bring his wife back. But then unfortunately, you know, his wife never came back but then we could remove his tumor. Probably he found another wife or so. Anyway. And um, another example of how extensively our tumor can be, this young gentleman, this is a post-op scan where you can see that, you know, whole of his back is full of tumor. And this is a, a neurinoma. It's not a glioma, just to give you an example of how extensive a tumor can be. The doctor is, you know, holding the whole of the tumor that we have, we have removed. So most of the time we remove small chunks of tumor from the body, but sometimes it can be so aggressive and we have to remove such a large amount of tumor. So now coming back to my uh, main theme of presentation today. So brain tumor are diverse group of neoplasm arising from different cells within the CNS. Uh, uh, a systemic cancer are, uh, or it can be metastasized from other part of the body and goes to the brain and it can be benign or malignant as with other tumors and um, if the origin of the tumor is glial tissue then we call it glioma it can be from any other tissue that is present in the brain but when it comes to the origin of the glial tissue not the neurons then it's called a glial tumor and it is divided into low, two types a low grade and a high grade a low grade is a well differentiated which is not anaplastic and a high grade is undifferentiated and a very anaplastic malignant cells and out of these the glioblastoma multiformis which is the main topic of the talk today is the most aggressive form of the tumor out of all these tumors. So when we um, classify uh, brain tumor glioma into grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, then glioblastoma multiformis 
comes into GLADE 4 tumor. So if you look at this picture, then you can see that um, glioblastoma multiformis, multiple forms. It has got a multiple forms, so it's called multiformis. So there is an astrocytic differentiation. You know that it is coming from, uh, you know, the glial tissue. A neuronal uh, nuclear atypia is there, you know, mitosis can be seen, there is a necrosis because it's rapidly developing, so the vasculature cannot cope, cope with its growth, and uh, there is a microvascular proliferation, as you can see here, and pseudopalisading and necrosis. These are, you know, the hallmarks of glioblastoma multiformis. And... Uh, there's a lot of confusion about brain tumor and uh, if there's a lot of confusion then they try to make a lot of classification. So there has been a lot of classification that has been made on glioma till date. The first edition was which came in 1979, then in 1993 as a blue book and then the third edition, fourth edition and then the fourth edition revised which is the latest which, is, uh, which came in 2016. And these differences is mainly made by histology and lastly by uh, immunohistochemistry and also genetic study. Once we started doing genetic study, then we started understanding that although histologically all look same, but then genetically they are totally different and their prognosis, their long term survival rate was also totally different. So that's why the latest revision of 2016 came up. So, as I have just said, molecular and immunohistochemical testings, which includes mainly that change the scenario of glioblastoma multiformis, is IDS, IDS1, mainly IDS1 mutation, whether there's a mutation or not, and also IDS2 mutation. If you have an IDS1 mutation, which means that they have got a good prognosis and good biomarkers, and uh, this can be done by immunohistochemistry. And uh, if there is a, you know, uh, IDS1 is a wild type, there is no mutation, then it has got a poor prognosis. And uh, also there is a 1P19Q codilation, which uh, is mainly seen in oligodendroglioma. So if astrocytoma is mixed up with the oligodendroglioma, then you can see this codilation. And if you see this codilation, then that tumor has got a good prognosis, although it's a glioblastoma multiformis. Uh, and uh, this can be done by these PCR and FIS techniques. And um, also another biomarkers is an uh, important biomarker. There are many, many biomarkers, but I've just quoted the most common ones, the ATRX gene mutations, and um, seen in 45% of anaplastic astrocytoma, and uh, it, it, if you see this, then it's a hallmark of this is an astrocytoma and nothing else. And if you see this, then again, there is a good prognosis on these tumors. So what, is, what causes brain tumor? Why people have brain tumor? Many patients comes to me and ask me, Dr. What did I do wrong in my life that I have this? And uh, so it's basically till now, we don't know the cause. So we have to say there is a multiple factors, maybe the genetic factors and maybe the progenetic factors, both environmental factors, both are involved. But um, some of the genetic factors, which is well known, are neurofibromatosis type 1, type 2, and uh, Turcotte syndrome and uh, some other things. But one of the most identified and uh, cause is ionizing radiation, uh, which is a well-established risk factor. But uh, how much ionizing radi radiation naturally we are getting, uh, besides you know atomic bomb or uh, nuclear explosions or um, you know accidents, we don't know. So you know uh, this is an environmental factor. Probably we have very little control till date. And uh, some inclusive like head injury, some food, occupational exposures, electromagnetic field like cellular telefo telephone, like there was a very, very big when cellular telephone came, there was a big debate whether cellular telephone is safe for human being or not. 
because most of the time you you if you are right handed you are carrying the telephone on your right hand and um, so you know you are um, you may be prone to right temporal lobe glioma there was a lot of studies and uh, some studies said yes you after telephone um, you know use you have more right temporal glioma has increased but then there was another group of people said you know there is not much of difference but then still it can be of course so you know most of the time if you can avoid putting the telephone on your ear itself and use a earphone then that would be better and some allergic immune phenomena like you know is has got a, actually a protective uh, role like IgE asthma eczema these are the people which seems to have with the control which seems to have a little bit low incidence of uh, uh, glioma so clinical features they can present with any forms uh, it doesn't mean that they have got a set form of presentation as you know that um, brain is the only structure in the body which is which has got selective uh, task performance by selective part of the body like frontal lobe has its own work temporal lobe has its own job amygdala has its own job hypothalamus has. so depending on where the tumor is arising the symptom may vary from hearing loss to vision loss to you know increase in appetite decrease in appetite and so on and so forth and many times when patient to come to us and say i have a headache just simply headache or we just screen the patient for you know a usual test and then incidental tumor we have seen many many patient who has labeled as migraine for a long time and then we do a scan and then find that there's a brain tumor so incidental is is not uncommon so if you go and do a brain scan then you may have a small tumor then that you detect so recently our proposal is that anybody any adults who is at the age of 50 they should have at least one scan of their brain whether it's a ct scan or mri in their lifetime so and then but then the presentation can be that of increased intracranial pressure like headache vomiting uh, some kind of neurological deficit depending on where it is confusion memory loss you know personality changes if it's mainly on the frontal lobe uh, about the seizure there are many books which say that the first seizure should be you know you don't treat for seizure or you don't investigate for seizure but um, my personal uh, strong uh, teaching is that you must must uh, study the first seizure because every seizure is first seizure in their life so you may miss that chance of detecting a brain tumor or some you know nasty uh, brain pathology so every seizure should be evaluated and if everything comes normal then first seizure you can just ignore and may not treat it but then yeah, that is that may be the time when you can get some very important information and uh, but the seizure activity do not uh, correlate with the tumor grain a uh, tumor in the eloquent area like speech area memory area you know they, they will have a very profound uh, deficit profound neurological symptoms if it's on the pituitary you have pituitary symptoms if it's in the visual cortex you have visual symptoms so on and so forth so for investigations uh, maybe to start with we do a ct scan most of the time this is the cheapest and most easily available the only drawbacks is that it has got a radiation effect so you know tend to avoid in children uh, unless it's really necessary so if you are screaming at people just for headache then the probably mri would be a better a solution than CT scan and uh, so uh, uh, the main thing that is said but then the most important thing is unless you do an enhanced uh, CT scan like in this case the lower picture where you can see a fuzzy you know looking but then you don't know what's going on but unless you enhance that picture you don't know uh, whether it is actually some pathology or not so just plain CT is not enough. So if you want to do, you have to do a enhanced CT scan. 
and uh, it will have if, if it's a glioblastoma high grade glioma then it will have a mixed density uh, somewhere it's a necrosis somewhere it's a cellular pro proliferation so the density will be mixed if there's a calcification then most of the time it says that it is a um, uh, low growing uh, low uh, tumor so there can be a cystic component on the necrotic part there may be some hemorrhage if you know the vascular proliferation cannot co-op with uh, the tumor growth and um, so on and so forth and uh, so the ma most of the time the margins are irregular and uh, there will be hypodense central and there will be a mass effect because there's uh, some new tissue that has grown so you can see that it is shifting and you can see that it has grown and uh, caused a mass effect so next investigation is that of MRI which is the standard test where you will do a T1, T2 and flare at least and an enhanced uh, gadolinium enhanced MRI where again unless you do a gadolinium enhanced MRI you don't see how clearly the tumor is being enhanced and you don't you know you, you cannot delineate how much to remove uh, so on and so forth. So if it's a high grade glioma then you can again see an irregular margin maybe central necrosis uh, area of enhancement area of non-enhancement so heterogeneous type of presentation is there and uh, MR spectroscopy is another test which uh, is routinely done these days and uh, spectroscopy is actually the test which started MRI itself. So MR imaging started from MR spectroscopy, the chemistry used to use it. So here we study the chemistry of the brain uh, and the brain tissue. And uh, most of the time, if, we, if it's an elevated choline like this, very high choline and decreased acetyl aspartate, MAA, then um, uh, then it, is, it suggests that it is a high-grade glioma. So you can put your voxel in different parts of the brain and see how much of uh, choline and uh, N-acetyl aspartate and uh, creatinine and so on and so forth. So different chemical structures will give you whether it's a low-grade glioma or a high-grade glioma, you know. So this is a very good information, especially when you are confused with the tumor and infection. Most of the time, this will give you a very good picture of what you are dealing with. And uh, another test is uh, to look at the blood flow of the brain itself, which is called dynamic uh, susceptibility contrast MRI, where you can look at how much the blood perfusion is happening in, inside that tumor. And uh, most of the time, it is a high-grade glioma. There's a lot of metabolism going on. So there's a lot of blood flow uh, in that area and then you can pick that up by a graphic and there is a ratio that you can have cerebral blood volume uh, ratio and that will give you, um, you know, automated calculated values which uh, can give you a hint about whether it's a glioma, a low grade or a high grade. Like these two are a high grade and low grade gliomas which has got a different values here. And... Uh, uh, to add on, like this is one of our patients where you can see there's a glioma right sitting on the motor cortex and uh, now we want to know which part of our body um, uh, correspond to that and whether we are removing that par part of the tumor we are going to damage any structure or not. So when you do a finger tapping test uh, with an MRI which is called functional MRI, fMRI, hand tapping so this is a hand area where you can see that the activation is more it's again looking at the blood flow in that area if you tap your hand then that area of the brain will have more metabolism so you can see it like this and this is the leg area so these are the parts which we have to avoid in order to remove this tumor so that we don't give deficit to the patient so this is very very important add on uh, test that we can do on a tumor patient. Uh, another test that we routinely do these days is called a diffuse tensor imaging DTI 
which is which gives you a tactographic you know flow of the of fibers that connects from the brain to the spinal cord and to the periphery so different tracts will have different colors right and left like green uh, you know anterior aperture corticospinal tract will have blue and uh, you know front to back will have red and different colors can be designed uh, designated to different tracks depending on whether it's a right and left whether it is front to back or whether it's a up to down or down to up something like that and uh, like in this case the previous case same case where you can see that these are the part that you want to avoid so that you don't give any motor deficit the blue one is a corticospinal tract now uh, spect and pet are two very important tests that you can add on to give you some examples of uh, how much you know uh, the metabolism that is happening in that part and uh, sometimes to detect smaller tumors also it is helpful and it will also give you some conclusion some some idea about how uh, uh, aggressive the tumor is but uh, PET scan is not mandatory before doing uh, any brain tumor surgery so it's, it's an add-on information that you can get now before you go on to operate on somebody then you need to know the language area and uh, the memory area when it comes to temporal lobectomy so most of the time we have left side is the dominant side but sometime you know we can have a right-sided uh, dominance also like in this lady so we inject a propofol or uh, 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 barbiturate whatever you have and then you inject it directly into the carotid artery and knock down one part of the brain so they, they become paralyzed so see we injected on left side she became paralyzed on right side and then she will stop speaking if it's a uh, left side of the brain is controlling her you know um, uh, speech and then we also ask for memory test we show her some cards and then ask her what what was the card that we showed her before we injected the proper form so if she can properly answer there are some scores then if she can answer then we know that the memory even if you remove that part of the uh, hippocampus amygdala then you know the patient will not have any problem so this is a called water test so sometime for language and memory, we do this water test as well. And uh, so now when it comes to a lesion where there's an extensive involvement of the insula, the temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, and the tumor has gone into the basal ganglion and into the internal capsule, then you need to have some kind of uh, study during surgery so that you know that you are not damaging the brain when you are operating on them so in such cases we use uh, uh, different techniques and uh, most of the time we use a uh, motor evoke potential like this which is implanted on the uh, skull itself and then you know there are some signals that we pass electrical signals that we pass through the skull and then we record it in the hand to see whether we are damaging the corticospinal tract or not or we can also test the uh, other pathway which is a somatosensory pathway and see that you know we are not damaging the sensory pathways so this can be done neuronavigation i will talk again and cross cytology is something that you can do if you have a frozen section in your center that's the best but if you don't have frozen section, you can at least do a cross cytology, ask your pathologist to give uh, the result when you are operating, just to give you an example, whether it's a high grade or a low grade, so that you can tailor your surgery um, in time. Awake craniotomy, which will, I talk again, uh, is something that you can add on. And safe gross total excision is something that we all are practicing these days. So we don't want to give additional deficit to the patient. So our removal will need to be within the safe margin, but then we want to remove as much as possible. Why we need to do that, we'll tell you, I will tell you again. So this is a setup of a neuronavigation where you can, the patient can be navigated. Their you know, MRI is recorded in the computer 
and their different parts of the body are you know registered in the computer so that it matches with the MRI so once and then CT scan MRI can be fused it's a fusion image and then when you move your tools surgical tools then you can see where you are touching you know and then you can actually navigate within the brain and then try not to damage the normal part of the brain itself so this we routinely use in our setup and uh, if it's a deep-seated tumor if it's a difficult deep-seated tumor where navigation will not be correct enough like in this case which is pretty deep one you don't want to miss it then you can do a stereotactic targeting or do a biopsy or you can just follow that tractography uh, track and then remove so this is a stereotactic frame where you target you know this we wanted to remove the whole of the tumor so we just you know um, uh, did a stereotactic uh, localization and then after we localized then we followed that pathway and remove the tumor or you can just do a small borehole and take out the tumor and do the biopsy uh, other uh, adjuvant uh, things that you can do is uh, uh, some dye called 5 ala fluorescent which you can inject or other dyes and then once you are operating if you have a 5 ala filter in your microscope then you can see that there is a blood brain barrier disruption and then that 5 ala uh, brights up and then it looks red so the tumor root looks red and then you can remove that red parts and then you know that you have done a complete resection um, the result with use of 5 ala and without 5 ala is controversial and uh, 5 ala is very very expensive uh, one injection cost about one thousand five hundred dollars but actually 5 ala is nothing but a fertilizer you know and um, it is found find, find in the alibaba in the in kg you know you can buy it in cases that's exactly the same chemical structure but then you know medical uh, people when they make it a medical uh, uh, drug then they charge so much that uh, most of the institute will have hesitation using it because of its cost factor and uh, you know using it doesn't mean that you know you are going to cure the patient it looks fancy but uh, the result are not that and um, again the awake craniotomy that i will talk um, just now like um, in this patient uh, uh, there is a you know diffuse type of glioma in the left side of the brain in a, in a young lady so you can which involves the Broca's area so it involves the Wernicke's area so if you damage this then they will have a profound you know um, problem so what you can do in such cases is that our con uh, concern is preservation of the speech. So, so here what we do is we uh, once we it's called sleep awake sleep technique where you put the patient into sleep first and then once you do a craniotomy which is which makes a lot of sound you know and then once you have reached the um, desired spot then you wake the patient up and then you stimulate the part of the brain that you think is uh, our eloquent area like in this lady we are you know we are concerned about the speech so we are asking her to read the newspaper and then stimulate that part if we touch the um, Broca's area she will immediately stop speaking and then we know that uh, we have damaged uh, this is the part that we need to avoid and we should not remove you know so uh, to preserve the speech we can do this or you can do the same thing on motor area when you stimulate then they will have problem on uh, hand movement or leg movement so you can do that so with such techniques you can remove a lot of tumor like this and uh, six months follow-up she has got no deficit on speech and on memory and uh, 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 a gross total excision of the tumor uh, can be achieved for treatment of low-grade glioma you know complete surgical resection is curative most of the time low grade means grade 1 and grade 2 a double of grade 1 and grade 2 so and if you do a near total excision you know there is a chance of you know delayed 
secondary malignant transformation is also avoided and uh, if there's a resection of the optic pathway or a hypothalamus deep midline structures you know maybe you can do a selective resection depending on where it is and so here is a gentleman where I operated on this child uh, when he was uh, six months old and last time he came to meet me when he was 22 years so you know almost 22 years of follow-up normal life they have no deficit so you know brain tumor doesn't mean that you know you know you, you it's the, your life is gone if it's a low-grade glioma then you will have and you do a good job then you can have absolutely a normal life uh, so there are many many patients like this but when it comes to a low-grade but diffuse glioma like the previous one where the margins are not very clear then total resection may not be possible most of the time so you may leave behind some of the tumors and um, so you have to give some kind of adjuvant therapy add-on therapy like radiotherapy and chemotherapy which I will discuss uh, in detail so if it's a diffuse glioma even if it's a low-grade glioma most of the time it's not curable and uh, you have to you know give uh, further treatment and further follow-up uh, Sometimes you come across with it. This is a low-grade glioma, which uh, is very very extensive and uh, in the in the center of the brain and which has which involves both sides of the brain so in such cases you know sometime a very good you know thinking and then uh, with the use of microscope and endoscope like uh, when I did this surgery many years ago I didn't have a neuroendoscope so I borrowed a cystoscope from e, uh, the uh, ureteric colleagues, colleagues <coughs> and a laryngoscope from ENT colleagues flexible scope and then you know made just two burr holes and with microscope and endoscope from one side and then alternate you know uh, we could remove and then with some improvisation of the technique by ourselves like nasopharyngeal tube and endoscope is put like that we could suck out a whole of the tumor from just two burr holes so Sometimes, most of the time, your target is to do a minimally invasive surgery so that you damage the brain as little as possible. Like this much of the brain can be removed from two burr holes only if you can plan accordingly. But most of the time, this is not possible. Like in this case, like this young child has got, you know, extensive tumor on the skull base into the brain, into the hypothalamus, into the ventricles, into the temporal lobe, and to the ethmoid sinus, and into the sphenoid sinus. So in such cases, you know, you have to do an extensive uh, uh, resection, uh, including the nose, into the eyeballs, and then remove all of the tumor. So uh, the purpose of showing these two things are depending on the case, you may so open small or if you need you may have to open extensively and remove as much tumor as possible this is the boy this is the pre-op that is the post-op and you know a little bit of scarring is there but he's a happy boy and uh, sometimes we face with uh, a problem like this this is not a meningioma this uh, this is not a glioma this is a meningioma on an 18 years girl who is six months pregnant you know and has got an enormously large tumor and uh, she, and uh, there's a lot of mass effect on her and uh, pregnancy uh, the hormones in pregnancy result in rapid growth of the tumor itself so some somehow you have to take it out but then she was six months pregnant so uh, we you know made a special table for her and then so that she is not kept in a prone position uh, her tummy was not pressed and then we approached her from the uh, back and then this is the lady afterward and with cesarean section she could have a normal child you know so uh, these are some of the challenges that you can you may have to face uh, doing uh, uh, brain tumor surgery at times so 
these are some of the bad candidates of um, uh, glioma that may present to you. Uh, very large left-sided dominant hemisphere, uh, nasty looking most likely glioblastoma. And uh, this is a basal ganglia, right-sided but very deep, again a glioma. This is called a butterfly lesion, which is through the corpus callosum, it has gone into both sides. So the both of the hemisphere is involved or the brain stem is very, very badly involved. Or this is called a multicentric glioma where you can see satellite lesions away from the main tumor, you know. So these are nasty tumors that you may face and the, you know, the result most of the time is very, very bad in these cases. So this is another case of a glioma where there is a diffuse brainstem glioma where you can see that there is no, no worry where you can enter into the brainstem. Whole of the brainstem is diffusely involved. And I refused to operate on this child. And I said that, you know, radiotherapy would be the only options that he has. But somehow they landed up in another centers where they operated on her multiple times. And they spent a lot of money and uh, eventually the child died and the parents became very, very poor. So, you know, we have to be very honest with our patients and if a case like this comes, there's a limit to what the science can do in a case like this and we have to be a little bit blunt to them in the first instant and then tell them that this is an incurable and this we must, we, we should learn to say that. Uh, these are some of the high grade deep-seated tumors that we actually operated although these are not very good cases but then uh, with the help of uh, neuronavigation stereotaxy you know these patients can also be operated some of the examples that I have given here and uh, this is a gentleman which has got a glioma in the uh, brain stem which has exophyted it it has there's a there's a mouth that has opened into the fourth ventricle here so this is these are the cases that you can actually enter through the tumor and take it out like in this case this is the gentleman post-op so there's no deficit and you can remove the tumor even if it's in the brain stem even if it's uh, like another case where it's a 10 years girl with a left-sided weakness of two by five first we did there's a lesion here which is very very deep into the thalamus and uh, we did uh, a stereotactic biopsy first on this girl and found that this is a uh, pilocytic astrocytoma. And uh, we said, we thought, oh, we must try to remove this tumor. So, uh, because the pilocytic astrocytoma has got a very, very good long term survival rate. So, through the tract, we went into the tumor and then we could go and remove whole of the tumor in this girl. And then, you know, six months follow-up scan which shows that the whole of the tumor has been removed this is the track that we followed and she has got a little bit of hemiparesis because we have crossed the uh, internal capsule to reach the other end of the tumor but then uh, you know she is a happy girl so and then this girl eventually her hemiparesis will come up because she's pretty young and then she will have a normal life so even if it's a deep-seated tumor if you think it's a low-grade glioma, then you should attempt to remove it. And uh, so treatment options of high-grade glioma, uh, I would say that there are actually three options. One, if you think this is a really a very, very high-grade glioma and you are sure by spectroscopy and other tests that it's a high-grade, then you should give an option of do no treatment. Uh, I will explain to you why I am saying this because uh, uh, many a times you are just adding few months by doing different surgeries and different other techniques. So you must give them a, an option depending on where you are, you know, and most of the time in our country, the patients are paying out of their pocket and uh, you should not, you know, uh, make them poor and then, you know, eventually they will die. Another option would be just to take a biopsy by stereotaxy or neuronavigation and to, you know, give them a histological confirmation that you are dealing with a high-grade glioma. All the thought is excision and do a biopsy 
and depending on the immunohistochemistry, the histology, whether to add on radiotherapy or chemotherapy. This is how we are. We give all these options to the patients before we go on. The Stroop protocols, which means that a maximum safe resections, uh, which is a, a kind of a cytoreductive surgery, and um, the median survival will be about six months in glioblast or multiformis. If you add radiotherapy on that, then you may add another six months. So the median survival will be 12 months. And if you add chemotherapy, temozolomide is the drug that you usually use, then again, another two or three months that you are adding, you know. So uh, this is published in New England Journal of Medicine. Most of the time, most of the institute are following this protocol. But then I still say that, you know, do no treatment could be one of the options and you must tell the patient that this can also be an option for you. But having said that, glioblastoma multiformis recently have changed its picture because glioblastoma multiformis is a devil. But the devil have got a bigger devil and a smaller devil. The bigger devil is a primary glioblastoma multiformis. Primary glioblastoma multiformis means it's a de novo uh, production of the tumor. Uh, it just became tumor from without anything. And 90% uh, of the time, that is what you are seeing. And it's seen in older age group. Uh, there is a genetic alternation and uh, EGFR is overexpressed. Uh, there's a PTN mutation and uh, IDS1 is a wild type, not a mutant type. So this is a bad case. So if you think, if you do a biopsy and get this, then you must tell that out of glioma also, uh, devil, this is a bad devil. And uh, there's another smaller devil, which is called a uh, secondary GBM where there was a benign tumor for a long, long time, and then it transformed into a uh, 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 glioblastoma multiformis, which was a low, low grade. And then, you know, they, are, they tend to present a little bit earlier in life, and genetic alternation includes uh, IDS1 uh, mutant type, and uh, other mutation like, you know, the I previously said, 19Q loss, and TP53 mutations and so on and so forth. So you have to do a genetic study and an immunohistochemistry and define what exactly is the tumor now, whether it's a bad type or a good type. And then again, after surgery, if it's a really bad type of tumor, then you can tell them that whatever you have done, you have done. Now, uh, probably you don't need to go further for treatment or there are these options whether you can go for that, but probably that will add another six months of life, that's all. So another test that we have not been able to do, but which is a very, very good test, is how much methylation there is, how much of methylation expression there is. And if you can do that test, and um, more methylation means more, uh, it's a better prognosis. And if you look at unmethylated and methylated, then there's almost like six months add on to their life, you know, if it's a methylated. So this is something that we can now add to our patient's uh, study and see whether it's a methylated or unmethylated uh, tumor. Uh, so again, coming back to, if you do just biopsy, then probably the patient will, you know, die almost by nine months. If you do an extensive resection, maybe they will survive for one or one and a half month, a year. And, um, you know, with radiotherapy, with chemotherapy, you in, add on few months in their life. So there is a paper in GNS on 1990 where they took a tumor specimen two centimeter away from the margin of uh, enhanced uh, CT scan. And they inoculated that part, the normal brain, which is two centimeter away from the tumor and inoculated that into a new mouse, which is an immunosuppressed mouse. And also they also grew, grew it. And then look at the motility of the glial tissue. Glial tissue have a motility and if it's a tumor, it moves more. So in, in both instances, they saw that the nude mass grew, grew tumor and the motility was also high. 
So they concluded that you have to remove at least two centimeter more if you want to do a gross total resection. And then another study was done that was four centimeter away from the area and then uh, this was on 1997 and uh, then uh, again they saw the similar finding so the conclusion of glioblastoma multiformis is that it is the disease of the whole brain it is not only a localized enhanced area in the mri or high density area high intensity area in the flare but much more larger than that so most of the time, the most limiting factor is this, that glioma is the disease of the whole part of the brain. And sometimes you have a tumor in this side, the opposite brain also have the tumor like you saw in the butterfly lesions. So glioma uh, survival, you know, so it only depends on what is the grade of the tumor. If it's a grade two tumors, their, their survival is pretty good. Grade one has got absolutely, you know, they've become cured. But then as you go on to the grade, then your survival rate becomes less. And if you just do a radiotherapy, the survival rate is, the mean survival rate is about 18 months. But if you add timozolamide, probably you add few more months. So this is uh, the malignant brain tumors. Uh, overall malignant brain tumors of different uh, diseases like oligodendroglioma, ependymoma, and blah blah blah, different tumors. And uh, some tumors has become very good in survival, you know, uh, like anaplastic astrocytoma, it is getting better. But if you look at glioblastoma, you know, the, the survival rate of glioblastoma has not changed much over the many, many years. So this is another paper which said that, you know, the operative skill and operative technique of the doctor has improved so much that the mortality and morbidity immediately after surgery has improved dramatically. And for low-grade glioma, the result is, has become very, very good. But when it comes to a high-grade glioma, then the perioperative mortality morbidity has gone down, but nevertheless, the overall prognosis of the patient of glioma has not changed since 1970s. So we are almost 50 years, there has not been a substantial change in the overall survival of a glioblastoma multiformis patient. And this is an area where new treatments, new uh, you know, modalities of research is going on. And we should also know that when we offer different type of treatment, to glioblastoma multiformis patients. We should remember this paper where it says that cancer, overall the cancer treatment in America are taking of 42.4% of the entire life asset is being used up on cancer treatment in most of the patients. So this, uh, this paper from Oklahoma University is a very, very important paper for me because we do not, we should not make them poor. We, just because the technology is available doesn't mean that it is suitable for everybody. So we must have a proper informed consent about this. Now, some, you know, latest uh, technology that is going on, ongoing trial therapies like uh, 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 Glidel uh, tablets that can be used in uh, the tumor bed after you remove. And this is being used in many countries right now and which has again added on another you know three months of survival and another is a uh, electrical current that you pass in the brain and then you know you wear it like this uh, overnight for many many days about three weeks and um, the idea is that uh, the current will stop mitosis because for mitosis there is a femoral uh, uh, you disrupt the uh, mitotic pathway, the movement of the uh, chromosome, and uh, then you stop mitosis. That is the idea here. And this technique is very simple. Maybe you can use it for recurrent tumors or things like that. And it has added about three months and there, there's no harm on this and pretty cheap technique. And gene therapy or immunotherapy are some of the things 
like in gene therapy what you do is you know you get a, a virus vector and then you inoculate it uh, some kind of enzyme producing uh, in the uh, virus vector and inject that into the brain and uh, their survival rate has increased uh, by again a few months in these cases and um, uh, immunotherapy is uh, like you know most of the time many of these patients are immunocompromised or they, they you you activate their own immune system to fight against the tumor because as you know tumor is being we are fighting with the tumor all the time and uh, we have tumor de novo tumor formation in our body all the time and our immune system is fighting day in day out you know so just to boost that and then you know try to increase your own immunity so some kind of vaccines and this has also shown a very promising result but not you know such a big leap has been achieved uh, the study that we are doing in our institute is um, uh, some plants that we use uh, for cancer therapy. We are using HeLa cell, brain tumor cells, and uh, other breast cancer cells. And these are the orchids that we use. And uh, uh, we have tested 11 plants. And, uh, and there is a very, very promising result that we have seen in these cases. And... Uh, so you know these are different plants that you have used and in different concentration the wild type and the tissue grown type tissue culture grown type both has shown that these are very good cytotoxic uh, values so all of us you know should also look at the things that is available uh, around us and see what we can do to help our patients these are the papers that uh, our institute has published uh, about the you know the use of plants on uh, brain tumor and uh, now we are ready at least uh, two plants that we are ready to uh, you know launch as a you know, add-on uh, medicine for those who where everything is exhausted the patient have nothing to do now then we want to you know just give them so that they, they will have few more months of palliative treatments so in conclusion uh, the first thing that uh, I think is that uh, all of us, all the countries in the world should have a national cancer registry so that we exactly know how much of the brain tumor are being identified because the picture that I showed in the early beginning is that, the, you know, after more CT, more MRI are being done, more and more of brain tumors are being detected. So. Uh, the, if you keep a proper registry in the whole country then probably the number of brain tumors uh, will rise and uh, we should always operate on benign tumors there was a time when benign tumor were not being operated they were just being followed up and you operate on uh, glioblastoma where the result is not good but then because of you know good skill good armament of surgery you can safely resect most of the benign tumors and cure them so you must treat all benign tumors surgery for high-grade glioma depends on total you know informed consent that you take with the family members and if they are, think that you know they want to take even if it's a high-grade glioma they want to give the whatever is available to the patient then you can go ahead and do the surgery and we need to individualize brain tumor management so that it becomes more cost effective and uh, we need to learn to say no this is now it's okay like sometime i operate on a glioblastoma multiformis they recall and they come back to me and say okay we want uh, another six months of life or three months of life so please operate then most of the time i said no i don't want to operate anymore it's not good and uh, so we need also to call incorporate alternative forms of medical treatment in such cases you know so this is the last slide that i have thank you very much for being with me so, you know, life is 10% what happens and 90% what you make out of it. So, what happens is what is the uh, tumor that we have. If it's a glioblast or multiformis, then, uh, you know, we are done with. But then there is 90% still uh, space that we need to work on to get a good outcome in 
glioblastoma multiformis or a high-grade glioma. Thank you.